G'day everyone and welcome to my Anzac portrait series. I'm artist Wayne Dowson. Beside me is my latest portrait featuring a young Lloyd Moore. Lloyd was born in Deepwater, New South Wales and joined the 12th Australian Light Horse Regiment. Upon the outbreak of World War II, Lloyd joined the 2nd AIF, 3rd Anti-Tank Regiment and embarked for the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy part one of our interview with Mr Lloyd Moore. My name is Lloyd Haig Mole, M-O-U-L-E. I was born in a small country town in northern New South Wales, a place called Deepwater. I was born to parents George Albert and my mother was Ethel Eileen Munro becoming Mole. I am the eldest of three children in that family. I have uh, both my brother and sister are now dead. My brother, five years younger than me, and uh, Charles Henry, and my sister, Una May, uh, she's two years younger than him. I had a very good childhood. I had very good parents and grandparents, and uh, everything was went wonderful for me. I enjoyed my youth. I'm very much a mother's boy. I love my mother dearly, and she spoiled me, of course, being the eldest of the three. And uh, Mum and I spent a lot of time together because Dad was a, was a shearer and he used to be away shearing for long periods. So Mum and I became very, very close to one another. Now, I went to school as the normal age for, you know, for kids and I didn't like the, school, the old schoolmaster and he didn't like me. But dear old Mum went to see Mrs O'Keefe who and she said, oh, I think we can get him into the convent school. So, which, which I, I went to the convent school, the best move I ever made. The kindly nuns there, they probably gave me a bit of priority because I wasn't a tyke then. And uh, so I did very well in one of diocesan bursary. And so I had reasonable education in those days. And uh, it stood me in good stead since. My next job was working on the station. At the station where I worked, they used to turn their, <coughs> send their cattle. They grazed sheep and cattle. And, and uh, in the winter time, we took the cattle to over the range, as we called it, and they went out into in, into uh, rough country up, up in the ranges. So then, once a year, we'd have, uh, at, when it when the summer arrived or, winter, or spring arrived we'd have to go and muster them. And I recall there was a fellow who used to make do poetry and he, was, he made a poem about the station people going out to muster the cattle. And he said there was Lloydy Mole, the town's boy. He couldn't ride a lot, but he said he'd be with them if the pace was not too hot. So, <laughs> so Lloydy Mole went out with them and, and it, it, was, it was steep country. And I remember I never got off my horse. Some of the old hands were leading their horses, you know, and I rode my horse downhill, up, uphill and down dale. One stage sliding down the hill, but uh, I never got off my horse. So the town boy didn't do too badly to, to stay with the horse all the time. Yeah. Now the horse that I had, I must tell you about Tarzan, a beautiful creature, 16 and a half hands high. That was a pretty tall horse, particularly for a short-legged bloke like me. And uh, he was a station-bred horse, and he was a proud horse. Tarzan always stood, he had his he held, head held erect, and he always looked as though he was ready for a photo. <laughs> and he, he uh, wherever, uh, he'd be amongst a lot of horses, and Tarzan would be outstanding because his head was always going, he missed nothing, and he stood above the rest. He, <clears throat> he and I got on well, despite the fact that uh, the boss at the station and all the other fellows said, he don't, I don't think he'll be any good to you, Lloyd. You'll not handle him. He won't, he won't accept all the military gear that you want to put on him. And uh, anyway, the day came for the issue of our gear down at the School of Arts pa paddock in Deepwater, and a crowd turned out. I think the reason they turned out to see how my horse was going to perform when he got this gear on him, on him. But I think he was like me. He wanted to be in the army. He accepted it. He never flinched. And from that day on, he and I got on famously. So he, uh, 
he just contrary to what everybody believed, he he did very he, he was good. Yes, a real good horse. I became very attached to him, and uh, I'd had a horse previous to that, a horse that I bought at the Shilling when I was a boy. I went to a deceased estate sale where they were selling all these horses, and it went over two days. And I'd been sitting on the rail like some of the other kids, wishing that I could had money to buy a horse. And finally, I think they, the auctioneer, they made it up and they said, have a bid. I said, I've only got a shilling. And they said, here, and a, a, a mare with a foal at foot, a big a mare in foal again, with a big weaned foal at foot came in. And I bid a shilling for the horse and he knocked it down to me. So that horse was Bob. Yeah, became known as Bob. And he, he was a wonderful horse. My father, who was a good horseman, uh, I said, Dad, will you break him in? He said, I'll mouth him for you. That is to put the gear on so that they're sensitive to which way they go, left or right or stop. And uh, he said, I'll mouth him for you, but you've got to break him in yourself. And I, I did. He never bucked, so he was as keen to get it go as I was. So it turned out a, a great horse. So I had, I've had the, the love of two wonderful horses. You know, Bob the first one, and then Tarzan, the, the big proud horse there. And uh, I was always eager to be in the army, hence I joined up to the AIF very early in the piece. And the, uh, I think what influenced me, on the station where I worked, the manager was an ex-light horse man from World War I, uh, the leading hand old fella, he was also uh, an ex-light horseman from World War One, so I was always interested in hearing their stories, and uh, and of course when the opportunity came to to join a light horse unit, I, I did so, did so very smartly. Yeah, my training in the light horse uh, consisted of uh, mainly uh, what we'd call horse sports. Uh, it was uh, uh, doing after you've done your sabre work. That's the so picking up pegs, tent pegging, and uh, then it was hurdles and that sort of thing, and generally manoeuvres of doing manoeuvres. The horse would, horses were doing what we did later on foot, and we used to have an annual get together of a huge camp that it'd be, and uh, then we'd have bivouacs that would perhaps take place every month or something like that, which kept us in touch. We'd do hurdles and tent pegging and all that sort of thing. I became very good at tent pegging, but it wasn't my skill. It was the fact that I had a hard running, so he used to gallop straight and hard, my horse, and all I had to do was sight the peg. And uh, I really liked my time in the, in the light horse. It was, it, was, it was very good. I left work at the station and joined the AIF. I was already in the militia in the light horse, but then I joined the AIF to serve overseas. So that was my move after ceasing work. And then I had a full-time job for a few years, you see, <laughs> at the Army. I joined at a place called Tamworth in northern New South Wales. And then we were sent to Liverpool in, in Sydney. And we were, we were quartered in old barracks that were there since World War I. And the old tin sheds were full of bayonet holes where fellas had been practicing and of course it was winter time then, it was June and the wind used to come through, whistle through there and it wasn't a very nice place at all. There was uh, quite a lot of uh, illness there, there were colds and dysentery and that sort of thing made it pretty uncomfortable. Uh, from there we went uh, to Sydney and uh, to Warwick Farm actually and Warwick Farm was uh, the, the race horse people we're still training there every morning. So naturally, we got a lot of good tips on races. So my father used to like a bet and I'd send the tips home to him. And he thought I was a good tipster. Actually, I was getting it from the race horse trainers. The next move for then was, was overseas. And we were pleased to get away from, from Warwick Farm. And uh, <coughs> we, were, we were boarded, uh, went aboard a 43,000 ton liner, the Orion. Which, which sailed for quite a while after. And uh, there were many troops. We went to New Zealand and picked up some Kiwis and then we sailed directly to, uh, to the Middle East. And uh, 
It wasn't very long after that that we were headed up the desert because the Germans had landed in Tripoli and were already advancing very swiftly the way that they did. They were highly mechanised and, uh, and uh, we were, were rushed up the desert to, uh, to a plate co called Fort El Makili. Now, Fort El Makili doesn't wasn't a very well-known place, but it was so important to the Germans, they had to, before they could take the brook, they had to take Makili because that was their water supply. There were wells at Makili and that, that was the prize for them. So we, that's where we went into battle against them. And for five or six days we held them. And uh, of course, as I said, we're anti-tank. The anti-tank guns we used were uh, <coughs> old Polish bofers. They'd been used by the Polish army, army and, and some of them retrieved, I suppose, when Poland, before Poland was... And they were, <coughs> uh, they were of smaller calibre and a, they had a projectile an armour piercing, an AP and a HE high explosive. But the pro projectiles that we were using were less than those used by the Germans on, the, on their tanks. So they were better armoured uh, than us and in a tank as, besides uh, as well. So we were very vulnerable being on the ground and the German tactic was n not to just destroy you, They'd, they'd encircle and then they'd say encircle and destroy. So they, to get it easy, they'd encircle you completely. You had nowhere to go, nothing to do, you couldn't defeat them. So it was a matter of, of capture. And that's why they took so many prisoners. But they, that was their, uh, that was Rommel's tactics, encircle and then, then destroy, yeah. So, uh, yes, from then, from being captured, of course, it was up went the white flag. I looked around and, and the other guns, there were several guns there. And the two of them were knocked out and some blokes killed and wounded. And uh, I looked around and every other gun had ceased firing. So uh, and I could see the little white flag going up here there. So I th thought we best join them to say it. And I said, what do you think, fellas? At that time I was in charge of the gun. The gun sergeant having been sick or said he was sick had left us and I was the next senior. I was a bombardier, so I uh, was in charge, and I said, what do we do, fellas? And they said, well, I think we've had it, Molly, so all right, well, we, <laughs> we surrendered. And strangely enough, they, they were fine-looking uh, soldiers, the Germans, and uh, a great number of them spoke good English. I, I inquired of one fellow, where did you learn your English? And they were recruited from the Ruhr Valley, and... Uh, uh, and the, the rule was an area that was under British uh, domination after World War I. And English was a compulsory subject in the schools. So consequently, a lot of these Africa Corps soldiers, and you've heard so much of Africa Corps because they were a great, elite, they were an elite fighting unit. And uh, that's the reason for so many of them spoke English. And I recall very vividly one fellow looked at me and said, for you, the war is over. But the war wasn't over for me yet because I had much came later, particularly after I escaped from the prison camp. But uh, they, were, they were very genial fellows and they could afford to be because they'd had success wherever they'd been. They had success in Poland, they had success in France and of course, yes, you know, they had success temporarily against us. Our treatment, I said earlier, that our treatment was quite good. There was no kicking and bashing and anything. The Germans were rather sympathetic and, as I said, they were speaking good English, most of them. For you, the war is over, I remember them saying. For you, the war is over. So then, of course, it, there wasn't much, they couldn't do much about feeding us because they didn't have a lot themselves in the desert. But uh, we, we, they, uh, we did, we did survive. Uh, somebody got onto some meat and they made a stew, but I think it was camel meat. It was the most terrible, horrible meat I've ever eaten. So we we believed it was camel meat, but that was all right. We ate it and we survived. They captured captured two troops, which is you know twenty odd thirty men, and uh, from then they took us to a place called Derna in North Africa, and there. They, they put us in a wire cage 
and uh, gave us some food. So that's where he ate the camel, I think it was. And uh, yeah, they gave us food and hard rations. They gave us <coughs> uh, an old hard Italian biscuit, I, was, I think it was, hard as the hogs of hell. And, uh, and, and we, was just, we survived. But it, we were very hungry a lot of the time, all the time we were hungry. Never got enough to eat, and uh, we were we were pleased when they finally uh, took us took us over to, uh, to the mainland.